Hello, this is a self-made drone and I want to show you the development process and why this drone is so special. So it all started in April 2020 in quarantine time when I bought a 3D printer to finally realize some of my ideas. One of the ideas was building a fully functional drone from scratch just with the help of my 3D printer. And I mixed an existing design I found on Thingiverse with the design of the DJI F450 development platform in Fusion 360 and started printing the parts of the frame. After the electronics arrived, I put it all together, configured and calibrated all components and it worked. Here's the first test. Everything came together nicely and all the hardware worked perfectly together. It was indeed easier than I expected. My goal back then was to build a drone that is cheap and easy to repair if something breaks. And in the best case, to not break at all. So I printed the arms with more elastic polypropylene instead of common ABS. You know this plastic from everyday things like lunch boxes and various packaging materials. Polypropylene is more elastic and doesn't break easily, but it is stiff enough to support all parts. So I had the hope that if something goes wrong, it will save me a lot of money. And I'm not wrong with this assumption. After I've got more confident in the controls and had more trust in my construction, I tried several successful flight tests. But on the last one, suddenly... I forgot to secure the prop nuts properly after putting them on and this was my punishment. One prop nut got loose and the propeller flew off. And no differential thrust means the drone fell straight to the ground and reached about 50 km per hour on impact. I thought the damage would be so high that I can rebuild the whole frame, but to my surprise most of the drone's impact was absorbed by one arm. The most force went into the polypropylene and saved the other components from breaking. The whole damage on the drone formed by this massive crash was two destroyed propellers, one lost nut, two servos from the camera gimbal and the bent arm that I had to reprint. Everything together cost me 11 euros and 40 cents, which is 2% of the value of the entire setup. And after replacing all components, the drone went to sky the next day again. But all in all, there was many issues with this frame design, so that I've decided to redesign everything from scratch again. Half a year have passed since the last flight. I've done a couple of other projects and gained more experience with Fusion 360 before I finally started the development process of the better version in January 2021. I also built myself a freestyle FPV drone and got also in that hobby, but for more on that, check out my other videos if you haven't done that yet. I started with the properties that my drone should have. This time I wanted a highly efficient setup with more than 30 minutes of flight time and that is capable of carrying around 1kg of additional payload if necessary. Because the development of such systems are like a never-ending circle, it is important to start somewhere and optimizing from that point. The best starting point is to estimating the weight first. Here I estimated a weight of around 3kg of maximum takeoff mass to start choosing parts. A heavy drone needs bigger propellers, and bigger propellers are usually more efficient, so I started to compare some motors and propellers to have an overview of how big the drone will get. I also started to think about how I wanted to build the frame and which materials I should use. 3D printing is a very good thing, but not particularly an option for parts that are exposed to high stress. So the main parts like the arms, the plates and the legs should be made of strong materials that are light and extremely stiff because of the size of the drone. I choose carbon fiber tubes for the arms and legs and glass fiber for the plates. It is a bit more expensive, but I know this will be more efficient and more stable than other materials. While carbon fiber is relatively easy to cut with normal tools, glass fiber will destroy every tool if it is not specially designed for it. Glass fiber is a really big pain in the... But luckily a friend of mine was able to mill the parts at work and the results are amazing. With all parts finished, I started the assembly of the main parts. 3D printed ASA clamps are holding the parts together. Here I also included a folding mechanism where the arm snaps into place and is held strongly. Also the legs have a folding design, but it is not the final version yet. Small parts that have to hold higher forces like the joints of the foldable arms and legs and the mounts for the motors 
are 3D printed with carbon fiber infused nylon. It allows me to print compact parts that have incredible strength. After all parts have been screwed together and the frame is complete, let's go to the electronics. Because you can't control each motor individually by hand, every drone needs a flight controller that translates the inputs from your transmitter into signals for the motors and stabilizes the drone. Here I used the MLED Navio 2 flight controller head for the Raspberry Pi. For those who don't know what a Raspberry Pi is, this is a fully functional single board computer of the size of a credit card that can run a full size operating system. In this case it is a Debian Linux distribution, so this is literally now a Linux computer that can fly. It is also the same flight controller that I used on my first drone. It has all the features I want to have, it is easy to configure and because I used it before, I know that I can trust it. The Navio 2 board adds all necessary sensors to the Raspberry Pi like accelerometers for stabilization, a barometer for measuring the height, a high precision GPS module and a coprocessor that controls the additional outputs. If anyone is interested in more details about the Navio 2, I will also make a technical review about it soon. To receive the control inputs from a transmitter, there has to be a receiver on the drone. Because I used the TBS Crossfire Long Range system, I have a Crossfire Diversity Nano receiver connected to the flight controller. This receiver also includes FLAM, that is a collision avoidance system that broadcasts and receives position and track data in order to selectively alert pilots to potential collisions between aircrafts. To store all the power that the drone needs, I use a 6-cell 5000mAh lithium polymer battery. The battery is connected to a power module that measures the voltage and the current draw to check the battery usage for calculating the flight time and warn when the battery is low. Finally, the power module is connected to a distribution board where the components are connected to. But the most electronics need a lower voltage. Therefore, there is a BEC that turns the 25 volts from the battery down to 5 volts for the electronics. For the motors, I used the T-Motor Anti-Gravity Edition together with foldable 15-inch T-Motor carbon polymer propellers. That pair of motor and propeller is the most efficient I have found for the weight I have to lift. Each motor is controlled by an electronic speed controller, short ESC, suitable for the voltage of the battery and the maximum current draw of the motor. The ESC takes the signal from the flight controller and controls the motor speed according to it. The motors are mounted to the bottom of the arm so that I have more space on the top. Therefore, all antennas have now a place on each arm to get further away from the electronics and from each other to reduce interference. Basically, this is all the drone needs in order to fly. But what is a drone without a camera and live video? Transmitting video feeds is harder than it looks like, because of the huge amount of data that has to be transmitted. Especially when transmitting digital video. But there's a solution perfectly suitable for this drone. So for the video system I use OpenHD. This is a further developed version of the open source project Wi-Fi Broadcast. The basic idea is to stream digital HD video over Wi-Fi without the downside of high latency and short range and without the need of expensive hardware. I use a simple Wi-Fi card and a second Raspberry Pi with the OpenHD image to take the video input from my cameras and send it down to my ground station. The cameras are attached to a gimbal which stabilizes them. The gimbal is also controlled by the flight controller so I can manually control the direction of the camera and have a stable video feed without shaking. For testing I used the cheap action cam as the main camera and used its HDMI output with a capture card to connect it to the Raspberry Pi. But this action cam was now replaced with a better and smaller camera to have enough space to put also my secondary camera on the gimbal. But what is the second camera you ask? Well, the second camera is a thermal camera. Because what is better than a thermal camera? A flying thermal camera obviously. This thermal camera is the HT301 from Xintai. It has a high quality resolution of 384 to 288 pixels and a frame rate of 25 fps. For those who think this is not that much, it is. Really. It has a real germanium lens for an understored image and a sensitivity of 0.06 degrees celsius. For example, you can easily see footprints on the floor after a person walked over it 3 minutes earlier. You can even see the cable of my ceiling lamp coming from the distribution box because the cable gets slightly warmer when current is passing through. And also the beams of my ceiling are visible because of the heat bridges. With this property it is possible to identify an animal within a range of 200 meters and detect movements even half a kilometer away. This video shows a pedestrian 520 meters away from me. I'm not 100% sure because there are very few sources, but 
it is very likely that this thermal camera uses the same image sensor than the Mercury reconnaissance drone of the German military. A very cool property of this thermal camera is that it is a generic USB video device, so it is basically plug and play on every device and can be used directly like a webcam. The camera encodes the temperature data in the bottom of the frame as pixels and it can be decoded if necessary. I've developed a driver that does exactly that. The driver decodes the temperature data and I can switch color maps and image enhancements with my controller to have more control over the thermal camera while flying. Also this driver was designed to work together with OpenHD. You can find a link to the source code and installation manual in the video description down below. When the drone is in the air it would be good to access the flight data like the position, the height, remaining flight time etc. These parameters are all part of the telemetry data which is a constant stream of all flight data that can be accessed in multiple ways. Usually a telemetry connection can be established over a serial interface, but also over a network. Over the telemetry connection I can not only access real-time flight data, but also change parameters, exchange files and upload mission data like waypoints that the drone will automatically follow. A set of waypoints can be uploaded to automate a whole flight, so that the drone can get fully autonomous. But also Lua and Python scripts can be executed, which can also control the drone fully autonomous to automate workflows like a flying robot. A great example for this can be the delivery of mail that we know from Amazon. Because my flight controller is a flying Linux computer with USB ports, I can simply plug an LTE modem with a SIM card into the Raspberry Pi and add the drone to a VPN. If this is done, I can connect to the drone from anywhere in the world. Over the internet. And the data is even encrypted. All that is left to do is to add my laptop or my phone to the VPN and I can connect a ground control station like Mission Planner or Q Ground Control to the drone. With all components connected, configured, calibrated and built into the frame, it's finally time for the drone to do what it can do the best. Fly. So let's go! Okay, let's go! But what is so special about this drone now? First of all, the drone can do the same things as the drones you can buy. It is a very efficient setup with up to 40 minutes of flight time that can also carry up to 1 kg of additional weight. She has a 4K 30fps main camera and a 384 by 288 25fps thermal camera with a low latency long range video system. Together with the Crossfire long range RC system, the drone can easily be controlled over a distance of 30 km or more with directional antennas. The flight controller and the video system are each based on a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with a fully functional Linux image. This allows me to add all kinds of peripherals directly via USB to the drone, like this previously mentioned LTE USB modem that connects the drone to the internet. This can also be interesting for penetration testing. Because I can connect to the Raspberry Pi via SSH, I can use it like a computer right in front of me. When I connect my two batteries to the drone simultaneously, I have enough capacity on board to use the Raspberry Pi up to 12 hours when the drone is disarmed, while leaving enough capacity to still fly 20 minutes. So while I land on the roof of a building, I'm technically able to, for example, use a software-defined radio like this tiny one from Nuelec to scan the frequency spectrum for key fob signals that I can then replay directly or later on with a hacker app or a yardstick to open gates, garage doors or even cars on flyby. I can also brute force a WPS pin on a Wi-Fi access point to gain access to a network or hijack wireless mice and keyboards and inject keystrokes to a PC nearby to create a backdoor. What the The possibilities are basically limitless. This drone can do everything, except making coffee. Well, I think when you have a coffee machine connected to a network or the internet, 
the drone can maybe even make you a coffee on flyby. Both video and telemetry connections can also theoretically be established over the internet, what makes the drone completely independent of the pilot's position. As long as the drone is unfolded and turned on, it can be controlled from anywhere in the world. Assumed you have a fast internet connection and the drone is not located in the dead zone. That can be a big issue when you live here in Germany. The video signals from the cameras can also be post-processed by the Raspberry Pi directly to automatically detect objects and control the drone according to it. But with an internet connection, also cloud computing can be an option for this. This whole drone, with all its features, has a material value of 2200 euros. Furthermore, it is a great development platform for all kinds of possible uses. Because no other drone can give you the possibilities to do whatever you want than one that is completely open source and also a flying Linux computer. It can easily be repaired and you can add every kind of sensor or camera to it. <laughs> if you would buy a comparable drone with the same specs ready to fly, you will not only be limited in the terms of possibilities, but you will also already pay 10,000 euros just for the drone itself without the camera. And if you plan to get a thermal camera for the drone, you can add another 8,000. And I think this is a big problem. On agricultural land, there are hundreds of thousands of young wild animals killed every year by the field work during the spring harvest. A quick and simple way to save the lives of these animals is to use a drone with a thermal camera to find them in the high grass. Unfortunately, this task requires a high quality thermal camera and flight times of at least 30 minutes to reliably find all animals. And local farmers and hunting communities are not able to invest that much money to buy a drone that costs as much as a new car, even when they pull their money. A drone that is easy to maintain and can be repaired by yourself, that can also do the exact same things as an expensive drone by having the same image quality, and that only cost one twentieth of what an expensive drone will cost you. This could be a solution for many problems and can change the future and the way we see the world tomorrow. Thanks for watching this video. Consider subscribing if you like to see more like this tech and stuff and feel free to support me also on Patreon. Here's Patreon. Bye.